That's okay. You need it like this way. Was it? That's okay. That's good. It's clear enough, like this. I will open it. Yeah, please. Okay. So we start reading in Hebrews nine. It's a long chapter, so I thought we'll read a few key verses and then we go over the whole chapter with the Lord's help. Hebrews nine. I'll read from verse eleven and twelve. And then from verse 22 to the end. Hebrews 9 from 11. Christ being come high priest of the good things to come by the better and more perfect tabernacle not made with hand that is not of this creation nor by the blood of goats and calves but by his own blood has entered in once for all into the holy of holiest having found an eternal redemption. And then from verse 22 to the end. Almost all things are purified with blood according to the law, and without blood shedding there is no remission. It was therefore necessary that the figurative representations, or literally the copies of the things in the heavens, should be purified with these but the heavenly things themselves with sacrifices better than these. For the Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hand, figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear before the face of God for us. Nor in order that he should offer himself often, as the high priest enters into the holy places every year with blood, not his own, since he had then been obliged often to suffer from the foundation of the world. But now, once in the consummation of the ages, he has been manifested for the putting away of sin by his sacrifice. And for as much as it is the portion of man once to die, and after this judgment, thus the Christ also, having been once offered to bear the sins of many, shall appear to those that look for him the second time without sin for salvation. So far the reading of the scriptures. Hebrews is a difficult book, and it is even more difficult because we have so many different translations. Uh, I have read from the New Translation by Brother Darby. We can read from the King James. And every translation has different words, and that makes it sometimes even more difficult than it's already. But Hebrews is a wonderful book. It speaks of the, the Lord Jesus, of his sacrifice, of his person. First his person, then his sacrifice. And then also of his ministry that he has now in heaven. It's a wonderful privilege to know the Lord Jesus as Savior. But then also to see what work that he has accomplished to bring us there. And also what he's doing now from the glory, through his spirit, he teaches us. And as we have expressed in the hymn, he's our great teacher, but he wants to produce a response to his great work. He is looking for a response from our hearts. And you know, this response, we are limited, we fall short in this, but that response is going to go on forever and ever. When we'll see the Lord in the glory, that response will be there, and we will see him as he is. We will be like him. And so there will be an ongoing response. And what we see in Hebrews is really the preparation for that. But also to take the scriptures from the Old Testament and to see how the Old Testament could not bring in completion. It took the coming of the Lord himself to bring in completion. And so we have seen in chapter 7 how the Lord Jesus, the great high priest, not only for our needs, we saw that in Hebrews 4, Verse 16, that we have free access for the throne of grace to come with all our needs. We have this free access. But what we have seen then in Hebrews 7, that we have such a high priest, in verse 26, who is now there for us, to help us, that indeed we can function as sons. He is the son, but we belong to the many sons. And he wants to help us to function according to God's plan. And so in Hebrews 7, verse 28, 
He is the high priest in connection with who we are. Sons. God wanted to bring many sons to glory. And God says, you know what? Such a high priest. Verse 26. I have prepared for you. So great. Holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, made higher than the heavens. That is the high priest God had for us. So it's not only a matter of our needs. It's also a matter of what God has in mind for us. That there's a company of believers, sons, sons of God. For them, God has such a high priest who is so wonderful, so great. And again, that is also in view of that response. And then we have seen that this new high priest, great contrast with Aaron in the Old Testament, this new high priest was brought in according to a new covenant. And we saw that the last time in chapter 8. This new covenant was needed because the old covenant was good, but it could never lead to perfection. And so that is why God has planned to have a new covenant. And the Lord Jesus is the author. The Lord Jesus is the one who sustains that new uh, covenant. And we've seen that in chapter 8. And we have seen that that goes together with the ministry that he has now in chapter 8 verse 1. We have. And that's something to really rejoice in. We have. When the scriptures say we have, it's wonderful. That's our portion. We have such a high priest who is on the right hand, seated the right hand of the throne, the majesty in the heavens. We talked about that the last time, how great he is. And this new covenant was needed in order to bring in this new order of things. The Lord Jesus could not be a high priest. He's from the tribe of Judah. But... God has brought in a new order, and that goes together with this new covenant. And what we will see tonight now, God has brought us into a new um, sanctuary. So in chapter 9, that we're going to talk about, we find a new sanctuary. In the beginning of chapter 9, we see how there is a uh, commentary about the old sanctuary on earth that God gave under Moses. And that sanctuary was characterized by two parts. It had the holy place where there was the service in verse 2, according to the divine ordinances. And all these things that took place there were ordained by God. But we have to keep in mind that those things themselves were connected with an order of things that could not bring perfection. And we'll see more about that in this chapter Tonight, And it says in verse 6, when these things were thus ordained, the priests went always into the first tabernacle. So that was the service they had every day, accomplishing the service of God. That was on a daily basis. And you have perhaps heard that uh, in the Old Testament, the priest had no seat, was always standing, was always serving. And then there was another element, and that's in verse 7, Hebrews 9, verse 7. There was the second part of the tabernacle called the Holy of Holies. And what we see there, the high priest could go in only once a year. And with blood of a sacrifice, not, and we'll talk about that later in connection with the Lord Jesus. So we're going to see parallels. But we see that the contrast between the old, thing, the old things that God had given and the new things that are introduced with the Lord Jesus, the contrasts are greater than the parallels. And I've mentioned it earlier, that is important to see. And yet, this Old Testament order was given to instruct us, like an object lesson, uh, like a pattern. And it is like a figure in verse, verse 9, a figure. It is really something to teach us. So you have the model of the tabernacle and God teaches us lessons. But you have to see it is a copy. It's a copy of heavenly things. So that goes together with verse 8. The Holy Spirit signifies that the way to the holiest of all was not yet made manifest. That's a very important point. 
so that there was an access to God, there was an approach to God, but it was limited to one man, the high priest. It was limited to once a year. That's very important to see that, because that gives us then the contrast with what we have now with the Lord Jesus, where we have free access. All the believers have this free access. Not only one priest or high priest. We all will see that later in this chapter. So there's an important object lesson here. So the Holy Spirit takes what he has given in the Old Testament. And I would say study Leviticus 16. Because Hebrews 9 is a divine commentary on Leviticus 16. And there you see how the high priest would go in once a year with the blood of a sacrifice. First a sacrifice for his own family and for himself. Then a sacrifice, the goat for the people. And then he, he would go in first with the incense. Then he would go in with the blood of the first sacrifice. Then with the blood of the other sacrifice. So that is Leviticus 16. And Hebrews 9 is a commentary on that. So we learn from the parallels. But we are going to learn more from the contrasts. Because the contrast we're going to see is, is not a high priest like in the Old Testament who could only go once a year. Now the high priest is there all the year. The Lord Jesus is there in heaven. And not only that, we have free access to see him there, crowned with glory and honor. And we are the beneficiaries of his ministry. We saw that in chapter 8 the last time. He is there, the minister of the sanctuary. And he's there for God's interest, but also for us, to sustain us, to help us, to encourage us. And so verse 9 says that those things of the old order are an a parable. Verse 9 says in the King James, a figure. In the Darby version it says an image. The literal word is parable. So a parable shows us something. It, it gives us an idea of what we're talking about. And so the Old Testament order is a parable for the present time that was going on still in Jerusalem. The, temp the temple was still there. And so what we see here in the tabernacle in the wilderness is was still going on in the, the temple at that moment. And there is a, a word that's very important in verse 9. Unable to perfect. The King James says that could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience. So the high priest could not be made perfect. No one could be made perfect as far as conscience is concerned. So no matter how many sacrifices that were brought, they could the sacrifices, the blood could cover the sin, and that is atonement. God was satisfied with those sacrifices, but those sacrifices could never make someone perfect in his conscience. It could not give them access, this free access. So there was, as it were, a barrier. And that is then further explained in verse 10. It's connected with meats and drinks and washings and ordinances imposed. How long? Until the time of reformation. Uh, the King James says that, but the Darby says until the time of setting things right. God had in view a time that things would be set right. That's the millennium. In the millennium, things will be set right. Everything will be uh, straightened out and correct. And now we live already in the good of these things. We live now under a high priest who have set things right. We have one who has come. That is verse 11. And that's important to see how verse 11 starts. But, but Christ. So in contrast to what we saw in the tabernacle that God gave in the Old Testament, there is now a contrast. Christ has become high priest of good things to come. So this is good in view of the millennium, the world to come. But we are already beneficiaries 
of this new order of things, the things that have been set right. We are beneficiaries of these things. And we are connected with this more and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hand. The more perfect tabernacle speaks of what is in heaven. The Lord Jesus is in heaven. Those things, the tabernacle there, God's dwelling place, is not made with hands. It's not of this creation. And so, if the copies of that tabernacle needed blood sacrifices, the sanctuary itself, the tabernacle itself, also needed a sacrifice. And we're going to see that in this uh, part of the chapter. So, what is the point now in verse 12? The blood of goats and calves could not bring this perfection. It could cover the sin for a while, but it could not give perfection. It could not make, uh, give you a perfect conscience. Now Christ enters. His sacrifice, he came through his own blood. You see that in verse 12? He did not come through the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood. So through his own blood, he has entered. So that shows the value of this blood that was shed once for all, on the base of that blood that was shed, his own blood, he has entered. Once for all. So that is a wonderful summary of the work of Christ. So it is... Verse 11, but Christ, the contrast with what went on before, Christ is the anointed one, according to God's thoughts. He is connected with a better and more perfect tabernacle, which is the heavenly tabernacle. He is connected with it, but he is also connected with the sacrifice, because even the heavenly things, and we're going to see that, even the heavenly things needed to be cleansed. Why? Because of Satan's fall, Satan was the high priest in the order that God has initially given. Satan fell, then we have the fall of man. Now, even the heavenly sanctuary was not pure in God's eyes. It needed a sacrifice. And the only sacrifice that could cleanse those things is the sacrifice of Christ. And on the base of his sacrifice that he accomplished, he has now entered, verse, verse 12. In the middle of verse 12, he has entered. So the, the shedding of his blood had such a value for God that now he could enter. And not only, not every year, because that would be need. Another sacrifice is needed. But this sacrifice was once and for all. That is so important to see that this word once and for all in verse 12 is really a key. I think it is used eight times in this, uh, uh, in this epistle. Eight represents a new order of things. And this, there is great emphasis on once for all. That is connected with Christ. The work, the coming of Christ cannot be repeated. The work of Christ cannot be repeated. And because of that completed work, he is now in the glory, he has entered there once for all, and he has found eternal redemption. So he is now in the Holy of Holiest, so the tabernacle on earth, the holy place where only the high priest could come once a year, is really a, a, an illustration of the Holy of Holiest in heaven, where the Lord Jesus is now. And he has there, he has made a eternal redemption. The word eternal is a key word for Hebrews, and so what the Lord has done has eternal value. And then he explains it in the following verses that we did not read, uh, the difference between the blood of Christ and the blood that was given in the Old Testament of goats and bulls, the heifer's ashes sprinkling the defiled, so there was the water of purification, Numbers 19, that could only sanctify for the purity of the flesh. But then the contrast in verse 14, how much rather or how much more shall the blood of the Christ who by the eternal spirit offered himself spotless to God, purify your conscience from dead works. So here is the work of Christ, 
but it's also connected with his person, the blood of Christ, the blood of the one in whom God found his delight, Christ, the anointed one, has been presented in the power of the eternal spirit. And the Lord Jesus offered himself spotless to God. So there we have God. In Hebrews, the emphasis on God, not on the Father. But I was thinking when you read this verse, Ephesians 2, verse 18. It's really nice to see that how the Trinity is involved in the work of redemption. In Hebrews 2, 18, we read that through him we have both, believers from the Gentiles, believers from the Jews, access by the Spirit to the Father. So the Trinity is involved in the work of redemption. Through the Lord Jesus, we have, that's what we have, another we have, access so that is that free access that we are talking about, by the Spirit to the Father. If Ephesians goes further than Hebrews, of course. Hebrews speaks about God, this access to God. But Ephesians, we see that God has adopted us as sons for himself, Ephesians 1, 4, and that is the eternal counsel that God wanted to bring many sons to glory, and now we have a relationship with the Father. But my point is that, you see that the Trinity is involved. And there is, that's the case also in Hebrews 9. In connection with this work that the Lord Jesus did, he shed his own blood. And we talk about the blood a little bit more later in the chapter. And he did this through the eternal spirit. Again, the word eternal there. So through the Holy Spirit, through the eternal spirit, he offered up himself. And he did that spotless. Nothing could be criticized. Nothing was lacking. It was spotless. That is uh, connected with the work of the Lord Jesus and also with his person. There's no flaw, no blemish, nothing of that nature. And the result is that he could present himself to God and it implies, and we'll see that later in Hebrews 10, that we also have now this free access to God. And here he adds to this uh, this point, purify your conscience. We saw that the Old Testament sacrifices could never purify the conscience. It would cover the sin so that God would be satisfied with for, the, for the moment. It could not purify your conscience from dead works. Dead works are the works that you do to try to bring in a remedy in your own strengths. But that can never work. So Conscience is now purified because of the shed blood of Christ. And that brings us then to worship the living God. God is looking for worshipers. And so that is, uh, in the King James, I think it has, I'm just checking it here. Um, to serve the living God. So the service is here as as worshippers. And so this is a service that we have already now, and that is possible because of the work that is accomplished, and not once a year, not for one man, but all of us, all the time, have now this liberty to serve the living God. And that's such a beautiful expression. The living God could not be satisfied with the old order that he gave. He gave the old order, which was good, but it could never satisfy him fully. It could serve as an illustration. It could help us to understand God's thoughts. But only the work of Christ, the coming of Christ and his work, could satisfy God and also bring satisfaction to us so that we now can be servants, uh, serving the true and living God. It's amazing. This is our privilege. And we were thinking of a response in our hymn and prayer we have this response now and everything that was needed has been done and so now we can serve the living God. If you want to study that, it's very interesting. In the Old Testament, the living God, we have many times, uh, I think 13 times, New Testament 15 times, or about 28 times in the, in the whole Bible. The living God, 
God is marked by the fact that he is the living God. And we have a relationship with the living God. And we can now serve him. What a wonderful privilege. And then in verse 15, we have further explanation to bring in some important points. For this reason, he is mediator of a new covenant. We talked about the new covenant in chapter 8, and I mentioned that earlier. A new covenant was needed in connection with this new order of things. And the Lord Jesus is the mediator of that new covenant. And that brings in then the, the results that many sons can serve the true and living God. And now this has taken place for the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant, that the called ones might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. Eternal inheritance. You have the word eternal again. So we are now sons and heirs. God has called us. And we have now this promise of eternal inheritance. So God has a plan for us. The living God has a plan for us, which is forever. And then there's a contrast, of course, with the Old Testament. Uh, first, a little parenthesis in verse 16 and 17, and then we go further about the contrast. Verse 16 speaks about a testament. Now, in the Greek, it is the same word as covenant. But in this case, it is translated testament because that gives the meaning of it. The testament is in connection with the death of someone, so that then, after the death of the testator, those who have this testament can benefit of the testament. And so verse 16 and 17 explains the need of the death of the testator. And so the Lord Jesus, he died so that we could be the beneficiaries of the, uh, the promises of this testament. And then in verse 18, we see parallel and contrast. There's a parallel that's connected with blood. The Old Testament, the Old Covenant was introduced through blood. It was inaugurated through blood. Verse 18. And then in verse 19, that's explained in more detail. For every commandment, having been spoken according to the law by Moses to all the people, having taken the blood of calves and goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop, he sprinkled both the book itself and all the people. You find it in Exodus 24, 19 and 24. And then saying, this is the blood of the covenant. So here we see that... This covenant was inaugurated through blood, through death, because the sacrifice was given. Death is there, and then the blood confirmed this covenant. So that is the parallel, but then we will see uh, one more detail in verse 21. The tabernacle too and all the vessels of service he sprinkled in like manner with blood. And verse 22 says... Almost all things are purified with blood according to the law, and without blood shedding there is no remission. So that's a very important statement, because that shows that the shedding of blood is absolutely needed for forgiveness. But the Old Testament, the blood shedding could only cover the sins, could not really give remission of sins. So... That's why I said it's a parallel, but also a contrast, because now uh, we, have the, we are the beneficiaries of this new sacrifice, the blood of Christ, and that brings remission of sins. But the other side is, without bloodshedding, there is no remission. So if you refuse the work of Christ, if you re say, I don't need it, then there is no remission. You are under God's eternal judgment. That's a terrible situation. So this shows there is a parallel with the old order, but the, the most important point is to see that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. The Old Testament could not give remission, could only cover the sins, and in that sense there was a temporary forgiveness, but only the blood of Christ could really take care of all. And so verse 20 3 goes on to say, it was therefore necessary that the figurative 
representations of the things of the heavens should be purified with these. And that's the point that I mentioned earlier, and I said I will come back to that. The, the tabernacle system was a copy, or here figurative representation, or the King James has... Um, pattern. So these things on earth need to be purified by blood. But now the point is also the original what was in heaven needed to be purified with blood. Not with blood of goats and, and bullocks, but, but with the blood of Christ. A better sacrifice. That's the point here in verse 23 and 24. So, even the things in heaven, of which the tabernacle is a, is a copy, the tabernacle needed to be purified and so on with blood and sprinkled with blood, as we saw in the earlier verses. But now, the point is, also, the reality in heaven needed to be purified. And who could do that? Only the blood of Christ was sufficient for that. In Hebrews, uh, excuse me, in Habakkuk is a verse that says that even the heaven of heavens are un impure in God's eyes. God sees the situation as it is. That because of Satan's fall, because of the fall of man, everything is um, become defiled. And who can purify the heavens? Only the blood of Christ. So, that is why the blood of Christ is so important. That's why this sacrifice of himself by the eternal spirit, spotless to God, was so important because only through his blood the sacrifice, uh, the, the, the holy things in heaven could be uh, cleansed. Well, there are a lot of misunderstandings. That doesn't mean that the Lord Jesus has carried literally his blood there. The moment that he shed his blood on the cross... And he said, it is finished. Then he died, and then we see that the veil was rent. We'll see more about the veil in chapter 10. And then God was satisfied. God accepted that work. And this will never be forgotten. The blood that Christ has shed keeps its value forever and ever. And we will see, if, therefore, the lamb is just slain. Revelation 5. This will never be forgotten. This sacrifice is so important. But the point is now that this sacrifice was also needed to purify the heavenly things. That's what we find here in verse 23. And because of that completed work, because of that perfect sacrifice, Christ has entered, verse 24, not in the holy place made with hand, like the high priest once a year on this earth, but the figures of the true. See, that's again what I said earlier in verse 23. The reality is in heaven. And that reality also needs to be cleansed. And he not only cleansed the figure of the true, he cleansed the true. And he has entered there in heaven. In heaven itself. That is... Uh, to point out the perfection of the work of Christ. And we saw that already in verse 11. Christ become high priest of the good things to come by the better and more perfect tabernacle not made with hand that is not of this creation but by... and so on. He has entered by his own blood once for all. See, there's a parallel with verse uh, 13, uh, verse 12. And now verse 24 here. We see how he has entered. Now we find uh, as a result of this work he could enter forever. And what is he doing there? To appear before the face of God for us. We saw in chapter 7 such a high priest um, God had the plan to give us such a high priest in verse chapter 7, verse 26. Such a high priest became us, was suited for us. And now we see here in chapter 9 that Christ has entered there for us, before the face of God for us. 
So you see, he is there to take care of us in the presence of God. And so that is how we have seen in chapter 7 how the Lord Jesus has brought us there already now because we are connected to him who is there and he has brought us there that we could be that we could function as worshippers. That is what God has in mind. So he is there to appear before the face of God for us, for our needs. It implies also the needs we have in the wilderness. But it also implies for us so that we can function as worshippers. That's what God is looking for. God is looking for worshippers. And so now he has appeared there. But that's connected with his coming into the world. In verse 26, he has been manifested for the putting away of sin. So he appeared, he was manifested, he appeared on this earth for the putting away of sin by his sacrifice. That is his first coming. So now he is, has appeared before the face of God, verse 24 at the end, for us. That's where he is now in heaven. He's taking care of us and he's taking care of the interest of God. We've seen that in chapter 8. That is, we have such a high priest who has sat down on the right hand of the throne, the greatness in the heaven, heavens, minister of the holy places and of the true tabernacle which the Lord has pitched, not man. That is chapter 8, verse 1 and 2. That's where he is. And now we see him in chapter 9. The Lord Jesus is there in the heavenlies, to appear before the face of God for us. It's amazing. But there's another appearance. And that's the end of the chapter. So, verse 24 speaks about his appearing now in the presence of God for us. And it is reiterated in verse 25, that that sacrifice that he did once and for all cannot be repeated. It is impossible to repeat that. But he is there now as high priest, entered into the holy places, not like the old, in the Old Testament every year, with blood not his own. Now Christ has entered with his own blood. We have seen that. Nor to suffer from the foundation of the world. See, Christ, when, when sin came into this world, Christ did not come and suffer as a sacrifice only in the fullness of time. But what he did in the fullness of time was sufficient to take care also of the sins done before. So what we see with the greatness of this sacrifice, it was sufficient once for all to take care of all the sins of the past and also of the future. This is the great sacrifice that we are talking about. That was once uh, accomplished in the consummation of the ages. Or the King James has the end of the world. So this is the, what the Lord has done in connection with his sacrifice once for all at the end, the consummation of the ages. And that was his first appearance for the putting away of sin by his sacrifice. Now, we have to be careful here. The sacrifice was sufficient that all could be saved. So what we have here in verse 26, the putting away of sin, that is the basic sacrifice the Lord Jesus brought. That sacrifice was so wonderful that John the Baptist could say, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. That is a great sacrifice. But in verse 28 it says, To bear the sins of many. That's not a contradiction. See, the sacrifice was so great that God was satisfied that all could be saved. But God does not set aside man's responsibility. God has not created us as a robot and God can push a button and... No, that's not... God is sovereign and he's absolute control. I'm, I'm not, uh, not dis de debating that. But the point is, God has given man a responsibility. And so that is why we have the many in verse 28. Because there are those who refuse that work. There are those who did not believe. 
There are those who say, I don't need that sacrifice. And so he bear the sins of many. That means he was the substitute for many. And that's a very difficult matter that only God can really explain. I cannot explain it. We can see on the one hand that the sacrifice is sufficient, that all could be saved. It was a sacrifice that was putting away the sin. The whole matter of sin was settled by that sacrifice. Yet, not all are saved. And that is a divine mystery. Not doesn't mean that God had planned a number of people to go to hell. That is a misunderstanding. But the consequence of the fact that if people do not believe, do not accept the sacrifice, the, con the consequence is, yes, you're going to hell. There is no forgiveness without the blood shedding of this uh, sacrifice. So if you refuse that sacrifice, then there is no forgiveness for you. So, the third appearance is in connection with the future. So, verse 26 speaks about once in the consummation of the ages he has been manifested for the putting away of sin. That is, on this earth, when the Lord Jesus accomplished the work on the cross. On the basis of that work, he has now entered once for all, in verse 24, to now appear before the face of God for us. That is his second appearance. That is now in heaven. That is connected with the minister of the sanctuary. Hebrews 8, verse 1 and 2. Such a high priest who could sit down at the right hand of God. We talked about that the last time. That is where he has this ministry. That's the second appearance. And when he comes back to this earth, just a little parenthesis, in the meantime, the rapture will take place, but the rapture is not discussed here in Hebrews. But, of course, we know that from 1 Thessalonians 4, from 1 Corinthians 15, the rapture will take place, and then the Lord Jesus will come with us, with the many of this present uh, age of grace. And then he will appear. Okay. Now let me correct this. It says here in verse 28, he will appear to those that look for him the second time. Without sin for salvation. So I have to correct myself. The Lord Jesus is coming and the rapture is here included. It is included in this statement. So, he will come to take us away from this scene, and in that sense he will appear to us that look for him. But you cannot uh, detach that from the fact that the Lord Jesus will also appear visibly with us to this, to this world. And that is without the matter of sin. So when he comes back, also with us then, is not in connection with the, set, the settling of the matter of sin. It is without sin. The matter of sin has been dealt with once for all, as we saw in verse 23, 24. And so, when he comes back, it's not. And it is for us. Now he appears for us in heaven, as the minister of the sanctuary, and he will appear for us when he comes back. We look forward to that. He comes back a second time, but then without the matter of sin, for salvation. Now, why for salvation? You are you're already saved. Yes. But our bodies are still subject to sin and decay. And in that sense, we also need salvation. So salvation is here the definite, the final salvation. The Lord Jesus has laid the foundation for this salvation by giving himself. He is now appearing in heaven for us, to take care of us, to lead us through this wilderness to save us from danger and harm. He is there to take care of us. But this salvation is the same that you have in Philippians 3.21, that we uh, expect him. We are looking forward. I'll just read that first. Philippians 3.21. It's a beautiful reference to this coming again, where it says, In verse 
20, uh, Philippians 3.20, our commonwealth has its existence in the heavens, from which also we await the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior. So we're looking for him as Savior. Why? Who shall transform our body of humiliation into conformity to his body of glory, according to the working of the power which he has even to subdue all things to himself. So the Lord Jesus will act as Savior also in connection with our bodies. And he has full control. He will subdue all things to himself. He had that power. And so in the twinkling of the eye, when he will come, he will transform our bodies and make us conform to his body of glory. It's amazing. That is what we are looking for. And then he will appear together with us. Now I'm back in Hebrews 9, verse 28. Without the matter of sin. The matter of sin has been established. So the rapture is included here, but it also his coming back is included here. And that coming back is not connected with the matter of sin at all. But it is for salvation, because as we have seen in Philippians 3, he's our savior. We need his action to transform our bodies, to make our bodies conform to his glory, glorious body. But in the meantime, and that's another point in Hebrews uh, 9, we are connected with him in heaven. We can respond to his sacrifice in worship and adoration. In the meantime, we have this free access. We see him there crowned with glory and honor. So how blessed is this to have such a savior? How wonderful he is. I realize that this is just a bird's eye view there is so much more in this chapter. It's so rich. It's so deep. It is, it is really wonderful. Every word in this chapter is worthwhile to study in detail and then also compare with other scriptures. But this is just an outline, a simple overview. But there is a depth in this chapter and in this, in this book. It's amazing. And that's why I mentioned this word once for all is eight times. There are other, uh, other expressions that are used three times. But this book represents a new order of things that God has introduced because of the, com the completed work of Christ, because God is satisfied and God wanted to bring many sons to glory. And so Hebrews shows the greatness of the Lord Jesus, the greatness of his work, but also the greatness of his present ministry. And that we have this free access now to be connected with him in the glory and to respond to him in worship and adoration. And so the next time, Lord willing, we'll see more about that. And that will then introduce us more into this great privilege that we have to enter in chapter 10, verse 19. In the Old Testament, we saw the high priest only could enter only once a year. In Hebrews 10, 19, we'll see a whole company of worshippers enters all the time, not only once a year, all the time. We can enter not only on Sunday morning. Any time we have this free access to enter as worshippers, and that's what the Lord is looking for, a response from our hearts. And so this is the company of worshippers that goes together with this new sanctuary. So let me just sum it up in closing this New priest was needed in Hebrews 7. For that we needed a new covenant, because in the old covenant the Lord Jesus could not function as a priest. Then we have seen that brings in a new sanctuary that we talked about tonight. And that is connected with this new sacrifice that he brought. We have seen about that tonight, his great sacrifice. But to, the next time in chapter 10 we'll see more about this great sacrifice, which is the basis of everything. And then chapter 10 show us a family of worshippers, a new family of worshippers. And we belong to this family. Praise God. And so this uh, book uh, brings the conclusion in chapter 13, verse 15. I'll just mention that to you, that you see the line. The li this line of having worshippers goes on throughout this book. And in chapter 13, verse 15, it's summed up this way, I'll just read it. 
Hebrews 13, verse 15. By him, therefore, so again, by or through Christ, let us offer the sacrifice of praise continually to God. That is the fruit of lips confessing his name. So this response that we're talking about is presented here. We may bring a sacrifice. We thought of his sacrifice, of his sufferings, and now he's looking for a response, a sacrifice of praise from, on our behalf, and did on a continuous basis to God. He presented himself to God, and now he wants us to present sacrifice of praise to God, and it is through him. It is because of him, it is through him, it is with him, and this response is going on forever and ever. It will never stop. The Lord Jesus is the guarantee of that. And so this is the exciting uh, thing that we see in this book, that the worshippers can enter freely. And it's for all. It's not just for an elite. It is for all the true believers. And the Lord is looking forward to such a response. And so that goes together with a better order of things that we have seen. It's a better uh, system of things. Everything is better connected with the Lord Jesus and connected with his sacrifice. And that's another key word. And then the other point is, let us. This is an encouragement. The verse that we just read, let us, is an encouragement to do this. And so there are many let us in this book. And I will close this that for your homework 14 times, let us. And so this is the encouragement that we have in this book to really go for the gold, to really bring this response and to lift up the name of the Lord Jesus before a holy and righteous God who is now also our Father, as we have seen in Ephesians 2.18. Praise the Lord. Amen.